All right, everybody. Well, uh, welcome to this presentation on the Masters of Science in Nutrition and Integrative Health Program here at uh, Maryland University of Integrative Health. I'm Dr. James Snow. I'm the Department Chair for Nutrition and Herbal Medicine here, and I'll be leading this presentation. So first, a little bit about uh, Maryland University of Integrative Health. Um, we are relatively unique in that uh, we're one of the few universities dedicated solely to integrative health. So everything that we do is around this particular field. We've got a vast array of, comp of, uh, of integrative health programs here at MUIH uh, that covers everything from acupuncture to yoga therapy, health and wellness coaching, herbal medicine programs, health promotion programs, nutrition programs. You, know, you get the general idea, a lot of different programs in the field of integrative health. And, uh, and some of those programs are truly unique. Um, you know, we, were, we were the first uh, to market for a herbal medicine master's degree, and we've been running that for over 20 years now. Uh, we're, I think, one of the very few yoga therapy master's degrees that are available. And so we do have uh, innovative programming. Um, and one of the things that is consistent around all of those programs, because we're just so focused on integrative health, is that there are commonalities you'll see through the faculty in each of those areas, as well as the staff and the university as a whole. And that is that we tend to have a holistic philosophy. We really believe in relationship-centered and whole person approaches to care. So that means we're gonna not just look in the field of nutrition, we're not just gonna look at the biochemistry, we're not just gonna look at the biological nutrient needs, we're gonna look at the emotional relationships with food, we're gonna look at the social components of diet, and we're going to look at that whole framework uh, to understand diet and dietary change and the challenges of those things uh, for individual people. Uh, we're a strong believer in the concept of a healing presence, which is essentially that as a clinician, you're not just a technician, um, that your words matter, that the way that you interact with the clients matter, and that you can optimize healing for people by um, by presenting yourself in certain ways and interacting in certain ways. So we have some material that we use around those concepts in all of our programs. And then ultimately we've got a deep, we started as an acupuncture school many, many years ago. And so we have a deep respect for traditional knowledge and ancient wisdom. And then we also have a lot of respect for contemporary scientific perspectives. So all of those things are brought into the programs as a whole and particularly in nutrition, we'll look at a lot of those different components together. And ultimately that leads to an evidence-informed approach, right? So the idea behind an evidence-informed approach, you're looking at the research evidence, you're looking at the individual client's particular needs and interests, and then you're looking at the, uh, from a practitioner perspective, you're looking at your own ethos and uh, your approach to care and your experience, and you bring all of those three things together in the work that you do with your clients. Uh, so the university started in 1974 as an acupuncture clinic. And so um, we are approaching 50, well, this is our 50th year, 2024. And um, and our talk, we have another major change taking place that you should all be aware of. And so I'll speak to that at the end of this list here. But we started 50 years ago as a small acupuncture clinic and then began, began offering ac acupuncture programs, including launching, I believe, the first master's program in the U.S. in acupuncture in 1986. Uh, in 2002, we expanded from just an acupuncture school, and this is where we started bringing in herbal medicine, which is my area of expertise, and that's actually, I came to the university in 2002 that helped start the, the Master's of Science in Herbal Medicine program at that time. We became accredited. We're a regionally accredited university. We continue to be that by a Middle States Commission on Higher Education. So um, that's an important thing for you to be aware of. And then most importantly for this discussion, we launched our Masters of Science program in 2011. And so this program has existed for 13 years now. And as you see just below that in 2013, we launched our first online programs and the Masters of Science and Nutrition was one of the very first to go online. So we have been delivering this program in the online format for 11 years now, which I think uh, we've really got a lot of experience in how do you deliver clinical training and how do you deliver high quality education in the field in an engaging way in an online environment. And we were one of the very first to move towards that. In 2015, we launched our first doctoral programs, and that includes the Doctorate of Clinical Nutrition. 
Um, we're talking about the Masters of Science program today, but some of the students decide that they want to continue on to the doctorate. And we have students coming from other universities into our doctoral program as well. And then finally, most recently, at least relevant to this conversation, in 2021, we added a post-baccalaureate certificate in culinary health and healing. And that is to some degree a subset of some of the courses in the master's program. But this is really an emphasis on the culinary components. Obviously, culinary skills and knowledge works intimately with dietary change and nutrition. And so we wanted to have a, a shorter program that emphasized these components for people who are predominantly interested in the culinary and the food preparation side of things. So the um, the, the, the largest change um, right now that we are going through and that you should all be aware of and probably are aware of, it's on the front page of our website and you can click through and see more details. But as of February 1st, so just a few days from now, we will be merging with Notre Dame of Maryland University, the uh, um, Notre Dame University of Maryland. And so uh, that is a big change for us. Notre Dame is a, a, a university that's been around since the 1800s. It's in, uh, in our local region. It is in Baltimore. Um, they have an undergraduate program. The, the, the undergrad program uh, is more generalized, but then they have a lot of um, graduate level programs in various fields such as nursing, pharmacy, and we are going to be moving into that graduate school and we're going to have our own school of integrative health underneath the larger umbrella of Notre Dame of Maryland University. So, uh, so that does mean that if you come into our program, um, you would actually come in and uh, you'd come in as an MUIH student, I believe, if you come in in the summer or fall, but when you, you will graduate as a graduate of Notre Dame of Maryland University. So um, I'm very excited about this merger for a number of reasons. Um, the, uh, our, na our current name implies integrative health, and I'm really excited to integrate our programs with some of the nursing components and pharmacy components. So we talk a lot about things like nutrient and drug interactions in our program, and it's going to be really exciting to have a pharmacy school there and have that expertise from the pharmacy perspective to talk about uh, drug interactions and nutrient drug interactions. So um, in general, I believe this is going to be a really exciting merger for us, but it is something that you should be aware of as you consider our programs going forward. So a little bit about the program. Um, as I've mentioned, it uh, integrates contemporary nutrition science perspectives with traditional dietary wisdom. And we believe that all of those viewpoints are necessary to address the complex role of nutrition in human health. So, um, you know, nutrition is not an easy topic and there's so many components to it. Um, you know, we talk about the idea that, uh, you know, there's policy factors that affect the way that we eat. There's social factors, there's environmental factors, both small scale in terms of our home environments and large scale in terms of the chemicals in the environment and the agriculture. And so all of those components, and then on the individual level, there's your social connection and social influences on diet. There's um, biological influences on the diet that we consume, the psychological influences. So we look at all of those components from a holistic perspective, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail when we look at the curriculum in a few minutes here. So who is the program for? Well, the primary audience is for people that want to work in a clinical setting. So it's predominantly geared for people who are interested in providing evidence-informed, personalized nutrition uh, and education programs. Um, either this, this slide states in a collaborative care setting. So we have a lot of um, alumni that want to work or do work in uh, integrative settings. So they, that may mean that they're working with conventional uh, physicians or conventional healthcare practitioners of one sort or another. And then there's other people that want to work in a collaborative format with purely complementary health practitioners. So they might be working with an acupuncturist in an office or a yoga therapist in an office. That said, while there are people working in those collaborative settings, a lot of people are also running their individual businesses. But the common theme throughout all of those is that people are working clinically to work with clients to provide healthcare. And so that is the main focus of this program. It is a clinically oriented program. And uh, the people coming in um, are either coming in, we have a wide range of people coming in as a first career or a second career. So first career, this might be some of you uh, maybe coming in straight out of undergrad. And we have a number of people that do that. But some of you may 
have had some experience in another field uh, that may be healthcare related or not. So we have nurses, we've had physicians, we have people with various types of healthcare backgrounds um, coming in to complete the nutrition program. And then we have people who are doing a complete career change. Um, so they may be moving from a completely different field that is not related to healthcare. And um, they've always had a passion for nutrition and they want to um, they, they want to build a career in that field. The average age of our students is around 39 or 40. So that gives you a sense. We've got people as uh, we've got people in their 70s in the program. We've got people in the 20s in that program. But on average, uh, they're usually late 30s, around 40 is our is our is our mean. Uh, um, I don't think I have anything to add on that. I think all, all, uh, well, one thing I would add to that is that because we have people coming in that don't necessarily have a healthcare background, and you can also see this in that we don't have science prerequisites to come into the program, those are built into the coursework. And so if you're sitting here worried because you haven't had organic chemistry or you haven't had physiology and you're wondering, you haven't had biochemistry and you're wondering how are you going to do this program and how are you going to be able to keep up with the science components, we build those in from the foundation up. And for those of you that have that experience, there is the option for um, for uh, waiving those credits or having transfer for those credits. And I'll talk about that in more detail in just a moment here. So I think uh, I've covered some of this. So the program does prepare students, as I said, to, um, to deliver personalized nutrition care, um, to both optimize health and manage chronic health problems. Um, we don't generally, we're not generally a program focused on like hospital-based care. So uh, our program, it, it, you might see some of that a little bit more in registered dietitian programs where you might be working in a hospital setting. Most of the people coming out of our program uh, are not going to tend, tend to work in institutional settings such as that. They're going to be more in an outpatient setting working with clients in private practice. Uh, it does provide health and nutrition science foundation, as I mentioned. It builds uh, skills and knowledge in clinical assessment and evidence-based nutrition therapy, and it culminates in real-world clinical experience. So you do get to work with clients as part of this program. And again, I'm going to go into more detail of that in the next few slides. Um, we are a holistic program. We are an integrative program. So um, we understand that nutrition is one, uh, you know, diet is one behavioral component or one input into our health. And there's a, a wide range of what we'd consider core foundational inputs into health. And so while nutrition is the primary one we're focused on, we do talk about sleep. We do talk about physical activity. We do talk about the health impact of social relations and the environment and stress um, to look at the root causes of health imbalances. So we're not gonna look at nutrition in isolation. You know, you may be eating a great diet, but if you're very stressed out, you're not doing any physical activity and you're getting poor sleep, it's unlikely that nutrition alone is gonna have the, uh, you know, is gonna create the changes that you might want to see in your life. So um, we do look at the evidence for these other components while we're talking about nutrition. So let's get uh, into a little bit more detail about the curriculum itself. So um, there's essentially two what we call areas of concentration. One is human clinical nutrition, and the other is the herbal medicine area of concentration. Um, I'm gonna start with the core base. So I, if you look at the numbers here, right, the herbal medicine is 57 credits. Uh, the human clinical nutrition is 47 credits. Um, but essentially of those, the vast majority are shared. So 42 credits in both programs are shared curriculum across both areas of concentration. So there's not a lot of difference between these areas of concentration. Um, the human uh, clinic, uh, the name herbal medicine is a little misleading because really what I would say for the herbal medicine area of concentration, it's human clinical plus herbal medicine. So don't think if you're going into the herbal medicine area of concentration, you're not going to be looking at clinical nutrition. You really are, the, the core 42 credits, that's really where you do your core work of um, clinical nutrition. In the human clinical AOC, it's really, we're not adding on the extra credits for herbs. And we have a couple of focus courses. So those five credits that are added in the human clinical, one is a herbal and nutrition supplements course, B12, 
because we do want everyone to have some knowledge about herbal medicine and herbal supplements, as well as the basics of supplementation. So there's a three credit course there, and then there's a two credit course about mindfulness and mindful eating. On the herbal medicine side, there's 15 uh, core credits that are the foundations of herbal medicine. And I'm going to get into more detail of those in just a minute. But this is for people that have a particular interest in herbal medicine and having an expanded role for herbal medicine within the context of their um, nutrition practice. Uh, one difference between those um, that is relevant for those of you that are considering a summer start. So the summer start is uh, in April. Um, the human clinical starts spring, summer, and fall. So that means it starts in January, April, and September. If you want the herbal medicine concentration, it only starts in fall and spring. So that only starts in September and January. See, there's a quid. Uh, okay, I see Santi, I see you um, mentioned that you're interested in the master's in herbal medicine. So that is different um, from this program. And so if you're interested in the masters, I'll comment on that when I get to the next slide. But the herbal medicine, those 15 credits within the herbal medicine area of concentration, those can all potentially transfer into the masters uh, in nutrition program. And so the masters in herbal medicine program, if you're interested in doing that along with the, uh, the nutrition uh, master's degree. You cannot be enrolled in two master's degree programs at MUIH at the same time. So what you would need to do would be to complete the nutrition program, and then you could take the 15 credits from this area of concentration if you wanted to do the master's in herbal medicine afterwards, and you could apply those. Those are essentially the first 12 credits plus one more course. So I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit more in the next slide, or in the next couple of slides. Okay, so... Um, let me just talk, you know, when you look at the curriculum and you see these 57 or 47 credits, it's a little bit hard sometimes to get your head around it and understand how all the pieces fit together. So these next few slides will walk you through sort of the way we build from the ground up. So there is a core science foundation. You know, if you go, before we can start looking at the role of nutrients in health, before we're looking at the, the role that nutrients play in biochemical pathways, um, and the, the way that nutrients interact with physiology and cell function, et cetera, et cetera. We need to have a foundational understanding of those biological processes. So there's a core foundation of science. Uh, the first three, organic chemistry, which then leads into nutritional biochemistry, and then separate from that is physiology. Those three are your classic core science co courses. The fourth one here, is research literacy. I consider this a scientific foundation. And research literacy is the ability to read the primary literature and the secondary literature in, in the field of nutrition or healthcare. Right. So um, what do I mean by that? So you know, if you're looking at a if you're looking at a newspaper article or somebody's blog and they're talking about the impact of nutrition, or they're saying, oh, this pub this paper just got published and it says this, this, and this. Well, you're essentially getting the pre-digested summary from another source. And sometimes those sources might introduce their own biases um, or may not translate that, um, may not translate that research entirely accurately. Um, and so you, you want to become familiar with understanding like what is the scientific foundation, particularly for clinical work in the field. So the research literacy course uh, helps you learn how to find the literature. So where do you go to look for it? How do you locate literature relevant to your particular question? So let's say you've got a, a, a client that you're working with um, that's got uh, type 2 diabetes and they're asking you about, you know, they're thinking about going on a Mediterranean diet and they want to know what's the evidence for a Mediterranean diet or is a Mediterranean diet a good idea for someone with type 2 diabetes? And so uh, you need to go no, need to know where to look for the primary literature for that. And once you find it, how to read it and evaluate it for the quality of the research that you're reading, and then understand, okay, now that I've read, I understand the methodology of the research they did. I've looked at the results of the study. And now how applicable is that to the clients that I'm working with? Um, all those types of questions are part of research literacy. 
And so one of the things that you get trained on in this program is how to find that research, read that research, and interpret that research. Uh, one last thing here. For those of you, there's two courses at uh, within the program where undergraduate credit can transfer. So although this is a graduate program, and therefore every other course other than the two I'm about to mention, require, if you want to transfer credit, it has to be from another graduate level program. We do accept for these 500 level courses, we do accept undergrad transfer. So if you have an anatomy and physiology combination course, usually people take like anatomy and physiology one and two, or you might have taken a concentrated physiology course, such as a three credit physiology course, and maybe you took organic chemistry based on whatever your major was as an undergraduate. If you have an organic chemistry course and you have a physiology course, those, assuming you've got a grade of B minus or higher, those courses will transfer to MUIH and that will reduce by six credits, the total of credits that you need to take to complete the program. So uh, so the next section, so that's a science foundation. Then the next thing we have is an integrative foundation or integrative health foundation. So um, the first course on this list, Introduction to Complementary and Integrative Health. This is an overview of, uh, of integrative health, complementary and integrative health in general. So this course, you um, delve a little bit deeper into some of the philosophies and characteristics that tend to underlie all types of integrative and complementary approaches to healthcare. So this is where you'll look at the concept of holism, uh, where you'll look at the concept of whole person, mind, body, spirit. Um, and then you'll also get an introduction to uh, some of the like core fields of healthcare in it, complementary and integrative health other than nutrition. So you'll get an introduction to herbal medicine, you'll get an introduction to acupuncture and an introduction to yoga therapy and health and wellness coaching. And so this is really not to give you expertise in these fields, but to understand like what do the people in those fields do? What's the, ev what's the strongest evidence in those fields for where they may be of benefit? And therefore, when you go out to work within the field of nutrition, where may you want to um, work in, a, in, a, in a, a synergistic way with other types of practitioners? So it introduces you to the field as a whole. It's also an opportunity to meet some students who are in other programs that are also taking this course. Uh, so it integrates you across the uh, institution as well. 637, the principles and practice of health behavior and self-care. Um, there's really two things that you do in this course. One is to begin to understand uh, the, the principles of health behavior and health behavior change and the science behind that. Um, it's one thing to know uh, what a healthy diet looks like for you. It's another thing to eat that diet. And so, you know, we all, probably, most of us probably could use to eat more vegetables than we do. Most people know that eating more vegetables is probably healthy for them what's getting in the way of eating more vegetables. So the science behind health behavior change is helping you begin to uh, understand the factors that impact change or get in the way of change and how do we work with those as we move into working with individual clients. This is also reflected in self-care. You take a look at yourself in this, in this course a little bit and start looking at your own self-care practices. There's that own line about practice what you preach. So if we're gonna be working with clients, helping them improve their own health, it's important that we look at our own health and our own practices and perhaps go through some of the processes of uh, making some behavior changes for ourselves. Mindful eating and nourishment, I think is somewhat self-explanatory. Redefining nutrition. This is really uh, a course where we look at the big picture of nutrition, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so we're gonna look at it from you know going big expansion. We're gonna look at it from a, a whole planet environmental health perspective. We're going to look at it from a social perspective, psychological perspective. What's the impact of agriculture? What's the impact of advertising and marketing? So understanding nutrition through all of those different lenses. And, uh, and part of what you do, and this is another self-reflection exercise where you look at your own diet, and ask yourself, like, how did I come to eat the diet that I eat? What were the factors, of, now that we looked at all these factors, what, which of these factors impacted me? 
Um, what was the uh, diet? What was the what, what? What did I learn in my home to influence what is my culture? And is, do I eat a, a diet that's specific to my cultural background? Uh, so on and so forth. And then, you know, part of that analysis is also to look at, well, what do other people do? And the goal here is really to understand that there's not one diet that's perfect for everybody. And so, you know, we hope that you come out of this course recognizing that there's a diet that's meaningful for you, but that may not be the same as for the other students in the course. And they may have a diet that's more meaningful for them and more appropriate and match, matches them. And therefore that also applies to your clients down the road. We don't want you to come out of this program with the idea of here's the diet that I want everyone to eat. And then you meet with people and you don't think about their culture. You don't think about their their finances, you don't think about any of that stuff and you're like, this is what you're gonna eat. That's not integrative nutrition care. So this course begins to explore all of those factors to help you when you work with other individuals to begin to explore what's an appropriate and good diet for this individual person. So I'm gonna look in the chat here for a minute. Um, So the, uh, so I see a question about uh, accessing the meeting recording later today. Um, that will be sent to you, I believe. Uh, so you should get that as someone who signed up for this. And then the NDMU's tuition, uh, talk to admissions about that. My understanding is that tuition is, is gonna be frozen for a period of time, but you're gonna get the definitive word on that for uh from ndm from um from the admissions team so contact our admissions team for that but my understanding is there's going to be no changes in tuition for the foreseeable future okay um so then with that foundation that we then move into a nutrition foundation so we've got our integrative base we've got our um We've got our science base, and now we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty of nutrition. So we're going to look at micronutrients, things like minerals and vitamins. We're going to look at macronutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, fats. Um, we're going to look at the cycle. Uh, and so in those courses, we start looking at how do these impact physiology? How do they, uh, what's their role in biological health? And begin to understand the needs of those things. Um, what's the difference between supplementation and dietary intake, what are the requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also look at the life cycle uh, with nutrition. So what are the needs from you know gestation all the way through uh, you know, geriatric care? And so we need different types of nutritional balance through different parts of our lives. And so that life cycle nutrition looks at all of that process. The next part that... Uh, I see a comment that says it's going to an online course. I'm not sure what uh, that means. This entire program is online. So uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but this entire program is in an online environment. Okay, so uh, another foundation that we look at is Herbal Medicine Foundation. This is only relevant for those that take the herbal medicine area of concentration. So if you do this, you get three credits that looks at the fundamentals of herbal medicine. So this is basically an introduction to the field of herbal medicine. Materia Medica, which is where we look at about 50 of the most commonly used herbs and look at all the details of those from botanical understanding through um, you know, what's the pharmacology, what's the phytochemistry, what's the clinical evidence, what's the traditional use, what's the safety information, what's the interaction information. So you start to really get a solid foundation in about 50 core herbs. Herbal pharmacy is about preparations, both those that are available in commerce and those that you can make yourself. So you get to understand some things about the preparation of um, medicinal plant preparations. Safety, I think, is self-explanatory. We do a deep dive here on toxicity and um, drug interactions and adverse effects. And then applied therapeutics is where you start applying all of that knowledge into clinical scenarios. So you'll have a lot of case studies in applied therapeutics, looking at applying what you've learned in all of those areas to individual clients. So this builds your knowledge and your ability to apply it within the context of nutrition care. For those of you that take the um, 
the, the human clinical area of concentration, the shorter area of concentration, then instead of that, you get, along with the mindfulness course, you get this three credit course on dietary supplements and nutrition practice, which does an overview of about a dozen of the core herbs, as well as a lot of um, more detail about quality control in the industry and selecting nutritional supplements. As a general rule, I recommend to most people to take the human clinical area of concentration. Um, so why is that? Well, first of all, it's 10 credits less, which means you're gonna save close to $10,000. Um, so that is a big difference when you're looking at return on investment. It also means that you're gonna generally graduate a little sooner because you've got one less trimester or two less trimesters to complete. Uh, which will allow you to start um, getting your return on investment faster. So it'll allow you to get licensed faster. If you need to get licensed, it'll allow you to stop um, you, to build your business and start your practice four months or eight months earlier. So those are all considerations. And if you do want the herb part, these first four courses here are actually what's called our post-baccalaureate certificate in herbal medicine. So you can take those first four courses, not the applied therapeutics, but the other first four, and earn it uh, after you graduate from the um, from the from the human clinical area of concentration. If you really want the herb part at that point, you can take that post baccalaureate certificate, take those twelve credits, and earn a different certificate. So in some ways, on your CV, it actually potentially even looks better to have here's my master's degree in nutrition, and I also have a post-baccalaureate certificate in herbal medicine. Um, breaking it up like that, I think, has a number of advantages. I've touched on a couple of those. Um, some people just say, look, I just want it all in one package. I don't want to be in two different programs. And so it is, I, I really love herbs, so please put me in the, the herbal medicine area of concentration. So that is certainly available. Um, but I would uh, encourage you to talk this through with the admissions team and consider your options. Okay, next curriculum highlight is the cooking lab. So we are very proud of these labs. We do believe that, um, you know, if you're going to be doing, making nutritional advice and working with clients, that it's essential that you have an understanding of the preparation of food, um, that you're not just handing out recipes without understanding what it takes to prepare those recipes. And so, um, so these cooking labs give you a really solid foundation in culinary skills, everything from knife skills, to how to prepare foods most effectively for a nutritional value. Um, those first two labs, everybody does. That's the core understanding foundational concepts of flavoring. So, you know, how do we use acids? How do we use sweet? How do we use salt? How do we use heat or pungency to affect the flavor of foods? And so a really, really nice solid foundation in food preparation. The other five labs, you have a choice of doing any two of these. And these are more specialized. So I'm not gonna go through the details of all of them, but I'll give you a couple of examples. So we have one that focuses more on fermentation and uh, foods that have a strong um, pre and probiotic component to them. Um, then we have another one that focuses on um, food uh, dietary restrictions. So how do you prepare foods or how do you uh, work with recipes where someone may have may be on a sodium reduced diet, or maybe uh, have severely restricted carbohydrate intake, um, simple carbohydrates in particular, or perhaps they have allergies or gluten intolerant, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so th that looks at those types of dietary um, you know, challenges. Um, there's another one that focuses on, on unusual, like on uh, organ meats for people that are interested in how do you work with cooking all parts of an animal? If you're going to work with animals, um, you know, how do we, how do we prepare liver? How do we prepare kidneys? How do we prepare heart, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, there's a number of different labs that can speak to people's particular interests. These are some of the only courses that are still available. Uh, in fact, they are the only courses that are still available in a face-to-face -face environment. So as I get to in a minute, the program is essentially entirely online. However, we do have um, a kitchen space uh, where we do, do hold these labs in person. It's not actually on campus, but it's here in Maryland, um, in the, right, right next to campus. And so for people that want to have the hands-on culinary experience, you are welcome to come to campus and they, they, they're in a weekend format. 
So uh, obviously most of the people attending are people who live locally, um, but we do have people, we have people fly in from as far away as California uh, to participate in our culinary um, cooking labs because uh, Dr. Eleanor Gafton, who runs these labs and oversees the labs, she's extremely experienced in the field. She worked in the hospitality industry for years as a chef and um, is a phenomenal instructor. So a lot of people really gravitate towards that hands-on experience. That said, Dr. Gafton's done an incredible job of transforming these into an online learning environment for those that, for whatever reason, can't come to campus or don't just don't have the capacity to come to campus. And so you still get a lot of that learning experience. We ship you culinary kits that have um, the equipment and food that you need uh, to, to work in these labs. So we send you a lot of dried goods and other things. So they're really well crafted and put together. And a lot of people consider these a real highlight of their experience in the program. So while that's the foundation, a lot of that is all the foundation, um, we then start building towards, you can always think of this as a pyramid, we're building from the ground up. We then start combining them and looking at moving more towards the clinical side. So that combination, oh, actually that number, that 638 should be 646, that's a different number. So nutrition 635, 636, and 646, applied clinical nutrition one, two, and three. This is where we start looking at um, what's the evidence for nutrients in various health conditions or dietary um, change in uh, in various health conditions? So essentially through three trimesters of these courses, you're going to go through a wide range of health disorders and look at the evidence. So you'll start with, let's say, we're looking at inflammatory bowel disease or we're looking at um, uh, type 2 diabetes or we're looking at depression and so we'll look at what is the evidence for nutrition both dietary and supplementary uh, nutrition uh, for these, these health concerns um, we'll also look as I mentioned earlier about the supplementary evidence for things like sleep and behavior change and physical activity etc cetera, etc cetera. but of course the main focus is on the clinical component and so over the course of three trimesters, you go through a wide range of diseases and look at the basic evidence for them. And this is the core of understanding uh, evidence-based practice or the, you know, the, the modern research evidence base for nutrition in healthcare. On uh, parallel with that, you are building your clinical skills in one and two. So this is where you start to learn to interact with clients. So what is the paperwork that you need to complete? What does a questionnaire look like? How do you elicit responses from clients when you're doing a health intake? What, what's a nutrition focused physical exam look like? How do you interpret laboratory data? How do you take all of that data from labs and from um, the, the, the symptoms and the objective uh, measures that you've done as part of your intake? And how do you take all of that and come up with an assessment and based on that assessment, how do you apply the evidence in order to come up with your initial recommendations for the client? Once the client leaves for those initial recommendations and they come back, how do you monitor and evaluate the treatment and how do you modify the treatment as you move forward? So that whole cycle of care, you begin to learn in clinical skills one and two. Um, that Nutrition 723, Advanced Biochemistry and Laboratory Assessment. This is a course where we go into greater detail about laboratory assessment in the field of nutrition. All of this then culminates at what I consider the top of the pyramid, which is real world application, which is um, personalized nutrition care. So here's where you're working with clients in a telehealth environment. So no, you don't need to come to campus to do this. It's all in the telehealth environment where you begin working with your clients under the supervision of our, our clinical supervisors. And we're very proud that we've, um, we've had a long-standing clinic here at MUIH, and that ability to work with clients is really a core experience for you to apply in the real world your clinical skills and knowledge that you've been building throughout the first trimesters of your education. So by having that supervised clinic experience, it allows you hopefully to leave and graduate with a level of confidence in working with clients because you've literally done the work as part of your degree program. Okay, I'm going to take a quick look at the chat to see um, if I have a degree in human science and nutrition, can I send my transcript to CFS? Yeah, so uh, both of the qu questions I'm seeing now, uh, 
go to the admissions team. I'll, I've got the link at the end, but if you're deciding between a master's and a doctoral degree, if you qualified for the doctoral degree, then um, start with admissions. They will almost certainly uh, then send you to me for an individual conversation. So my email address, uh, I'll put it in the chat here for everybody. You're welcome to reach out to me. Depending upon your question, I may send you to admissions. In general, I would say start with admissions because they can connect you with everybody. If you've got financial aid questions, if you've got um, your curriculum questions, they can begin to answer those. But if you've got like highly detailed questions about your fit and particularly they can begin to help you with things like transfer, but ultimately they'll decide whether or not um, they should refer you to me. And I meet with potential applicants almost weekly, you know, all the time I'm meeting with people, I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with you and figure out uh, what's the best program for you. And I'm very transparent. I mean, there's some people that I say, you know what, I don't think that this is the best program for you. I think there's another program at MUIH that's a better fit. Or at times I've even said, I think there's a better program at this other university that I think for your particular interest is a better fit. So I'll be honest with you and straight up with you about that. I want to make sure that this program is a good fit for you and that you're a good fit for us. And so um, that's part of my role through the admissions process. And uh, I'm more than happy to reach, uh, to talk to any of you about your individual uh, concerns or interests. So now let's just talk for a few minutes about the program format. So this lists online or hybrid. So hybrid means a combination of online and on campus. But realistically, it's an online program. The only on-campus options you have is those two credits of the cooking labs. So you're 45 or 55, depending upon which uh, area of concentration you take, you know, like 95, 98% of your coursework is gonna be online, whether you're in the online or hybrid. Most people take everything online, as I mentioned. And so, yes, you never need to come to campus. We have students all over the world, predominantly in the United States or North America, um, but we do have students from other parts of the world as well. And you can complete this degree without ever coming to campus. We love you to come to commencement when you graduate uh, to celebrate in person. But again, you don't have to. We understand the costs involved in that, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, the online environment is where a lot of higher ed is moving because it provides a lot of flexibility for people. So the length of the program, it's anywhere from two to three years, and that depends on the pace in which you decide to take the coursework, as well as what, which area of concentration you take. Um, I've already mentioned the total credits is 47 to 57, but what I will say is uh, let's do a typical situation. So let's say you're gonna take the 47 credit and you want to complete it in two years. If you wanna complete it in two years, if you do the math, you're gonna to need to average uh, essentially eight credits a trimester. If you stretch it out to nine trimesters, you're closer to five uh, credits a trimester uh, on average. So what does that mean in terms of time commitment? Well. Uh, the general rule for higher education is that for every credit that you're taking throughout the trimester, you should expect to spend three hours per week uh, doing work. So let me say that again. For every hour, for every credit, sorry, every credit that you take in the trimester, you should expect to spend on average three hours per week. And so if you're taking eight credits, you're going to average out to about 24 hours of work per week on the program. And so one of the things you just need to think through is can I carve out that amount of time in my in my uh, calendar to consistently um, dedicate that amount of time to my coursework? And so uh, to put it more simply, one three credit course is about nine hours of work per week. So you start thinking about how many of those can you do? And um, depending, it depends obviously, obviously a lot. It's all very individualized. Do you have to work full time? Are you working part-time? Are you lucky enough to not have to work at all throughout this program? Um, you know, what in general, how have how have how has your work and study habits and um time needed to succeed in coursework compared to other students? So while we say that nine is an average, some students um, you know, education comes a little more easy to them. They are more efficient in how they do assignments. And so, you know, if you you know that historically you're one of those people who has moved quickly through work 
and um, succeeded. Um, I'm not saying that you've sort of skimped on the work to do it in less time, but that you've been able to do high quality work efficiently in a shorter period of time, then you could probably reduce that nine hours to say as little as six. On the other hand, if you know it takes a little bit more time for you to read through technical material, uh, you want to take more time on the assignments, or you know that historically you need a little extra time on assignments, then that nine hours could stretch to 12. So you have to think about yourself as an individual, but ultimately you think about um, three hours for each credit or nine hours for every three credit course. To give you a little bit better understanding of the courses as a whole, so these are largely what we call asynchronous. And what that means is you're not all in the classroom at the same time. You don't have to be in class from 5 to 8 p.m. on Tuesdays or 9 at noon on Wednesdays. Um, the lectures are, the vast majority of lectures are pre recorded. Uh, the discussion boards are asynchronous which means that you put in your comments at one point in the week and another student comes in and add comments at another time in the week. And so we have students working at three in the morning. We've got students working at noon, nine in the morning, five at night, you name it. Students in a course are active uh, depending upon their lifestyle and their needs. And of course, there's different time zones. Now, all of that goes to say it's not a free for all. So it, these are not self-paced courses. So um, when you're in a course, there are specific things that need to be done each week. So if a, uh, uh, weeks typically start on the Sunday and end on the Saturday. So you have to participate in a discussion board or you have a quiz to take or you have a paper to submit and it needs to be done sometime within that week. But when you do it within that week has a fair amount of flexibility. So it's asynchronous but it is structured. And so you have deadlines for each assignment and each activity. Um, on top of, I did mention that it's largely asynchronous. So people say, well, does that mean I never get to directly interact with my faculty? No, you'll interact with your faculty in a number of ways, obviously through written and recorded feedback, but also many faculty hold um, optional live sessions. Um, some faculty do this as frequently as twice a week. Other faculty do it a few times a trimester. Um, th these are 95% of the time there's the odd time in the odd course where there is a required live session, um, but that's very rare. The vast majority of these live sessions are optional and then recorded for those who can't attend. So they may have a, like a, a pre-exam, have a review session and people can come and ask their questions and they'll record it. And everyone who couldn't attend gets to watch that after the fact. So that's one key way in which you can uh, interact live with your faculty. Another one is that faculty all have office hours, which means that and these can be structured or unstructured, but you can always reach out to your faculty and uh, request time to meet one-on-one -on -one with them to discuss an assignment or discuss something that you're having trouble understanding or some feedback that you want to give. So you do have that opportunity for a fair amount of interaction with them. Uh, Carolyn, so uh, Carolyn, I'll get to your question in just a minute here. So uh, program accreditation, we're proud of the fact that we're one of the two uh, uh, programs that is accredited by the ACNPE, which is the Accreditation Council on Nutrition and Professional Education. This is uh, a relatively new accreditor that accredits um, master's degree programs in clinical nutrition. And we are one of the two programs at this point in time that have um, met the requirements and gone through the process and become accredited. For licensure and certification, this varies at the state level. So a very important thing for you to understand is that a grant, so there are three related but separate things. There is an academic degree, there is certification or licensure, well, certification I'll say, and then there is licensure or practice uh, rights within a state, okay? So, um, Licensure occurs at the state level, certification is national. And so our program meets the academic requirements for the CNS certification. So that is the certification that we, our program is built around. So as a graduate of the program, 
you will have met the educational requirements for the certification certified nutrition specialist certification and you will on top of the degree you there's some postgraduate hours that you need to complete so postgraduate um, professional experience hours and then there's the certification exam that you need to take but once you complete those three things you can earn the cns certification so that's national any uh, any um, state that you live in all the same rules apply for earning the CNS certification. The next step, however, is licensure within the state. So the um, information about nutrition practice varies from state to state. Licensing laws, practice laws, those are state-based, not national. So I strongly encourage you to go to this website, the ANA.org, and look at your individual state. You can also reach out to us and uh, and we'll direct you to it, but um, but you need to understand the licensing laws for nutrition within your state to understand. In many states, there's no requirement at all. In some for medical uh, for for nutrition practice, in other states, the you are required to say, for example, have a license, and the CNS is a pathway to licensure. Um, but there are some states where licensure is required for medical nutrition therapy, and the CNS is not a pathway. So we have what are called green, yellow, and red states. And if you look on that website, you will see that. But the last thing you want to do is come to MUIH, earn your degree, get your CNS certification, and then realize that that doesn't give you, um, that's not a pathway for licensure within your state. So um, most states, it's not an issue, but particularly a number of states throughout the uh, central U.S. and the south is where you tend to see uh, potentially uh, more what we, as I said, refer to as red states in terms of practice rights. Career opportunities. Um, a lot of what people do is uh, private nutrition practice, as I've mentioned, um, and then practicing within a, a number of different areas. Consultation within nutraceutical companies or supplement companies, supermarkets and other nutrition related companies. We've got someone who does a lot of uh, nutritional, um, does a lot of nutritional advising for Giant, uh, which is a large grocery chain store here in, our, in this neck of the woods. Um, community health and nutrition educator, corporate wellness programs, working as a faculty member at community colleges in particular. Um, so there's a lot of People in the field of nutrition have, you know, what you might consider called like a portfolio career where you are doing multiple things. So I, for example, I've done clinical practice. I've um, worked in the supplement industry or particularly in the, actually in the, as one worked in one of the early companies that was a juice company that was starting to put supplements into their juices. So I worked as a consultant uh, in the supplement industry field. Uh, I've done research in the field of nutrition and particularly herbal medicine. And, uh, and obviously I work in an educational setting. So, um, you know, putting together a number of those different things over the course of a career is what a lot of nutritionists do. So next steps, um, I'd consider the virtual admissions tour or start an application or reach out to admissions, which is the next slide. Um, we have educational webinars. So this webinar obviously is geared uh, most specifically towards um, our programming, but we also have webinars that talk about the evidence for nutrition in various areas. So I did one recently on nutrition for mental health. Um, and so you can come to one of those types of events. I think one of the best things to do is to register to get a telehealth treatment within our natural care center, which is where the students work. And so... Um, Working at the natural care, uh, going to see a uh, student at the natural care center does a couple of different things. One, you may well get some, uh, should get some good nutritional guidance for yourself. Secondly, you'll get a direct understanding of what is it like to work as a nutritionist, seeing what that person is doing and how they're communicating with you. And then lastly, it, it's a pretty good way to evaluate our program. You know, it, when you're meeting with a student who's near the end of their program, do you feel like they're giving you good sound advice? Do they seem like they know what they're doing uh, as they work with you? So in some ways, it's a quality control check for you as a student who's considering coming into the program. So being seen in the student clinic is something I strongly recommend. And then finally, um, 
you know, this is really the place to start if you're, uh, you know, you know that you're interested in the program or, or you're continuing to consider it, is reach out to the admissions team. You can call them on the phone or you can send them an email and uh, and they'll start connecting you with, uh, they'll, they can answer a lot of your questions and start connecting you with other people if they can't answer them directly. So I think the last question I saw was about state restrictions. Um, so there are certain states, uh, I believe the question was, or oh, the comment was about Alabama in particular. So there are, there's, it's got to do with how schools, um, it's, called, it's called the SARA regulations. Um, and this has to do with schools being allowed to offer online programs to students in different states. And um, for some reasons that I, I don't think are worth getting into in, the, in this webinar, at this point in time, uh, there are certain states that we are not, um, that we're not allowed to, because of those restrictions, we're not allowed to provide online education to students in those states. As we move to NDMU, which as I said, is happening momentarily, it's um, likely that that could change uh, and is, probably going to and would change in a positive direction, meaning that it's it's likely that we'll start to be able to take students from those states, um, but uh, but not at this point in time. So if you live in one of the states that are restricted and there is a there's a link on the website about that, um, reach out to admissions. They can let you they'll certainly let you know and they can give you the link. Uh, to point towards the states, but I'd also stay in touch with admissions if you live in one of those states because it's highly likely that um, we're going to be able to deliver online learning there pretty soon. Okay, everybody, I don't see any further questions. Oh, uh, there's one more comment. Oh, no, thank you. Great. Yeah, you're welcome. I love talking to folks about our program. So um, like I said, I'm more than happy to reach out to me or reach out to the admissions team. And with no further questions, I'm going to stop there. I hope you all have a good day, and I hope to see you sometime down the road here at MUIH. Thank you.